Hey, good morning to you. Good morning. What kind of morning is it? Hey, Amen. Hey, it's so nice to say good morning to you and welcome to the Gunnersville Church of Christ on a Sunday morning. Right smack dab in the middle of the month, one of our colleges felt sorry for one of our neighboring states and decided at the halftime to give up a ball game and, and save the coach's job. So we, we have some wonderful people in the state of Alabama. And I, I don't know why we're laughing. It hurts to laugh, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, but it's so nice to have you at the Church of Christ this morning. And I, I missed last Sunday. Was way up at 3,000 feet in altitude and I got to lead a devotion up there. And, and uh, right before our event, let me tell you this. Every single one of the radio control model airplane enthusiasts stood up during the anthem. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and did we ever yell amen? And I must have missed something greatly. I asked Brother Philip this morning, I said, what did I miss last week? Because today's message is going to be the religious bully part two. And he said, let me tell you, I didn't get through last week. So I'm sure looking forward to today's message. Make no mistake about it. So let's all enjoy our uh, service this morning, and especially you visitors. If you're visiting this morning, you're just as welcome as the flowers in May when you visit the Gunnersville Church of Christ. Thanks for being with us. Brother Petrie, come on up and lead us in the good singing.
Let us pray. Dear Father, we humbly come before your throne as your body and your people. We're so grateful, Father, for the, the freedom we have to do so. We pray, Father, that we would be uplifted in this place, that we would fellowship one with another and with you as we commune, Father, in your body and your spirit. And we pray that as we leave this place, we would take the message that we are about to hear and that we would go out and glorify you and be a light to the dark world around us. We pray, Father, that in all things we would glorify you and the love that was shown through us through your the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his willingness to die on this earth that we might have eternal home with you. We ask this in all things through his name. Amen. Come out of every place and we'll sing this song while the men take up the offering. Come up out of every with me please heavenly father we're so grateful that you bless us each day and provide for us and uh, we pray that as we have given back this morning that these funds would be used wisely to further the gospel and uh, all the activities of this church father we continue to ask for your forgiveness and your blessings these things we ask in christ's name
As Christians, we meet on the first day of each and every week to worship our Lord. Um, there are many acts that we do in our worship service, uh, one of which is partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, if you're a new Christian or you're visiting with us, you may ask yourself why we're doing this. And then if you uh, have visited with us on multiple occasions, you may ask, why do y'all do this each and every week? So let's look at the, uh, the why we do this first, and then we'll look at the, the when we do this. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper when he was with his apostles the night before his crucifixion. I'll uh, read from Luke 22, starting with verse uh, 14. <clears throat> when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance for me. Uh, so that kind of goes over on, on why we do that, why it was instituted. Now let's look at the when. The frequency was not revealed to the apostles until the kingdom was set up on the day of Pentecost. From that time forward, Christians observed the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis. Let's look at Acts 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. And the, the Bible also tells us in Acts 2, verse 42, and that continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking in bread and in prayers. So at this time, let's clear our mind of outside thoughts and distractions. And let's think about the sacrifice the cross made for us as we do this on the first day of each and every week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity we have to come together and worship you. Father, as we participate in this observance, Father, we just ask that you bless us and watch over us. Father, as we take this bread, we, we pray that we'll partake of it in a manner that will be pleasing in your sight. Father, we ask that you please forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's go to our Father in prayer again. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this cup and what it represents. Father, as we partake of it, we pray that we'll do so in a manner that will be pleasing in your sight. Father, again, we ask that you please forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Psalm 4, Philip brings our lesson today. It will be, Lord, I lift your name on high. If you will, please stand. Children's ages three through kindergarten be dismissed through the song. Lord, I lift your name on high.
We're certainly glad you're here, and uh, I know for a fact we have guests uh, from not only our immediate area, from out of state, and uh, if you came for the fall colors, uh, you might need to come back in a couple of weeks. Uh, I was talking to a couple of people that had been traveling, and uh, they set up through northern Virginia. It's, uh, the, there's already some foliage, and of course it's working its way here, and uh, hard to believe that it'll be in the 40s uh, through the, the lows this week, and that'll probably uh, get those colors to change in a little bit, which will be better than last year, because last year with the drought, we had a freeze, and they all came off at one time. So uh, maybe we'll have a little more of a, of a traditional fall, and, uh, but whatever uh, brings you to our area, we are thrilled that you're here and uh, hope that our worship service thus far has been a source of encouragement. Uh, we're going to continue in a, a, a series that I began last Sunday, actually several weeks ago, but a, a part of this series I began last week, and I really want to conclude it, taken from Matthew chapter 23. So uh, if you would be opening your Bibles. You know, back during the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards was presiding over a huge prayer meeting. 800 men uh, were there and uh, for the purpose of, of having a collective, a, a collective prayer service. And before the meeting, Edwards received a note from a woman saying that her husband would be there and she asked if the men in that prayer service would pray for him. The note went on to describe him as, as, as someone who had become unloving, prideful, selfish, and really difficult to live with. Edwards decided that he would read the note and see if the man would identify himself for prayer. Edwards read the note to the 800 men and then without calling the man by name, he asked if the man who had been described would raise his hand so that the whole body could pray for him and over 300 men raised their hands. Well, I applaud that authenticity. I applaud, I applaud that honesty. And, and I, when I read that, I wonder, okay, would, would I have been willing to raise my hand? Because it's not easy, is it? It's not easy to uh, uh, acknowledge your own guilt. Uh, and I don't know that, if, that I would have raised my hand at that, at that setting. But, and the reason is because this is part of this entire series is we like to mask who we really are. And uh, that's, uh, that, that seems to be more and more of the norm. And, and today, we're going to wrap up this series. The overall uh, theme has been the pretenders. And uh, we've been walking through this series of, of, of uh, denouncements that Jesus has made toward the religious leadership. And I think it's probably good for our guest if, if I just kind of uh, remind us all that, that when Jesus initiated this, it's within days of his crucifixion. And it was the religious leaders of the day that Jesus found himself in conflict with more than anybody else. And so as we've worked through this, you've noticed that he's gotten more and more uh, direct. In the early part, the first uh, in this series of lessons, we talked about their hypocrisy and then we talked about the religious superhero, if you will. And then last week we talked about the religious bully. And what prompt, prompted this was a, a, you know, a series of seven denouncements. They're, they're in, the ter, in, the, in, the, in the text, they're, uh, they're described as the seven woes of, of, uh, uh, you know, of the Pharisees and the, and, the, and the chief priests and the scribes and, and everything that Jesus puts under that category. We noted last week that woe uh, is one of those unusual terms in, in the English language especially that basically the, just the pronunciation of it describes its definition. And so uh, Galen, if you will, let's walk through those first three of those woes just by way of reminder uh, and, and the accusations that he levels. The first one he puts up there uh, in verse 13, what was the issue? Well, the issue was, go ahead. The next slide, yeah. They make it difficult for people to come to God. Now, now, let me preface by saying I'm not spending a lot of time on these first three because really, that's not really our issue, I think, as a people. Certainly as a congregation. Uh, we, we do everything we can to make it easier for people to see God. And even in the second one we noted last week, what, what was the issue? 
Well, they, they, they were taking people down the wrong path. None of us would intentionally do that. None of us would intentionally lead people in, in, away from God or, or in a way that, that would ultimately result in them being separated from God. But that's what the religious leaders of the day were doing. The third one, uh, well, they were leading people, but they didn't know where they were going. And, and once again, I think with, with where we are as a movement, where we are as, uh, collectively as a body of Christ here, we, we take this at, at its, at its, uh, as, as its importance and its relevance, that we have to be very, very, very sure that, that collectively as a body that we're leading people in the right direction, that we're leading people toward God, and that our lives are not an impediment, that we're not keeping other people from reaching God. And it's when we begin to get to these last four that I think that, it, that, the, that the tenor of it changes. Look at verses 23 and 24 as, as, we, as we work through this. Woe to you teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices. The Bible tells us in Leviticus 27 and in Deuteronomy 14 that they were to do that. They were to give a tenth of things like grain and oil and fruit. Uh, all of these things uh, were, were to be given to the, to the, you know, to the priests specifically to support them and in, in a, in a uh, symbolic way giving that to God. And in that agricultural society the first part of everything was to be given to God. And so Jesus is acknowledging that but then he tells the Pharisees, you're going to all that trouble, not with grain and oil and, and, uh, and uh, fruit, none of that, but it was spices. And, and ladies, you know how small those, uh, those, those spices are, uh, dill and cumin. and all. They were, they were very, very meticulous about counting out a tenth of those. But look at what Jesus says. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out at a gnat, but swallow a camel. Now, we don't have time to talk about that imagery there, but it's a rather interesting picture that Jesus is painting. But what's the issue? They were missing out on what matters most. They were missing out on what matters most. They were paying attention to the parts of the law that they thought were important, ones that they think they can keep and the ones that they thought they could really, uh, you know, garner God's approval of, but in the process they were missing out on what Jesus calls the weightier matters of the law. Truth, justice, and mercy. And it's when we get to this point in, in, this, in this part of the text that I see a real struggle for a lot of us because we tend to, to major in minors, if you will. We tend to, to spend a lot of time on things that ultimately, in the reality of things, don't matter. Need I give you some examples? Well, just from the standpoint, and we're going to talk about outward uh, appearances in just a few moments but when we begin to think about a balance in our lives when we begin to talk you know to, to, to really be honest with ourselves about okay what really matters what are things that have eternal implications and then I look at how much time and energy and money and resource that I spend on things that aren't that important for instance and I know when I start down this list it's going to get pretty quiet but that's okay. It's the last one of the series, so, you know, we can, we can uh, go in a different direction next week. But what if? What if you spend as much time in personal study and prayer and, 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 and meditation as you do on Facebook? Ooh, it got real quiet. How much, you know, how, how much difference would there be in your life if you spent as much time talking to people about issues and problems and things that, 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 that we as a body could do to help them instead of talking about them. You see, we, have, we all have our own list of things that we think are really, really important, but ultimately, only those things of eternal consequences are lasting. You know, when, when we work through this, my experience, and I meant to get Lisa to put a... Uh, 
uh, kind of a subtitle after uh, this fourth one because we really move. We're, we're, I don't look around this morning and I see a whole lot of, of bullies. I think we have looked through the course of our, of our, our history and, and we've had enough of that. We have split and we have divided and we have fought over things of which Jesus said absolutely nothing. And we've called it contending for the faith. When in reality, there wasn't a whole lot of faith involved. And so I think we've kind of drunk that cup to its dregs. As a movement, we have seen what happens when you start down a path of trying to uphold rituals and traditions that are not anti-biblical, but they are extra-biblical and are not on the same level with doctrine. And I think we've seen where that has, has, where, where that's led us. And so instead of religious bullies, I think there's an interesting shift here in the latter part of this, of this address where Jesus begins to acknowledge the respectable fraud. How about that? The respectable fraud. Because you see, my experience, and I speak from experience as a fourth generation believer, my experience is that the longer people are in church, the better pretenders we become. After enough time, we realize that that confessing sin to one another isn't something you actually do. And if you do admit to something, then you keep it so generic and so general, you always confess to something lesser than what you're actually struggling with. Now, I know I'm painting with a broad brush here, but this is just, this is just based on, on you know, what I see. In time, respectable frauds learn not to talk about the disappointments in their, in their marriages. They'll learn that, that, that all of us parents act like we've got it together even though we feel overwhelmed. We learn that, 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 that women aren't, aren't feeling depressed and men don't say there's a woman at the office that I'm spending too much time with. Why? Because after enough time they figure out that when you come to church people don't just wear masks. They usually select the best looking mask that they have to wear. So with that in mind, we move to the fifth. Woe. Verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Jesus says, you clean the outside of the cup or bowl, but inside it's full of greed and self-indulgence. What, what's the principle? The principle is simply this. Do I have it? There you go. They were paying more attention to the outside than to the inside. That word there for greed uh, is, is more than just you know, wanting money. It carries with it the, the, the context of plundering and pillaging and extortion. And when it talks about self-indulgence, it has this, the basic meaning of a lack of self-control and, and, and was often used in other settings to denote unrestrained self-gratification. In other words, it's all about me. Whatever pleases me, whatever advances me, whatever advances my agenda. Now this goes beyond a condemnation of the religious leaders there in the first century. I believe that a lot of times that there is something that happens to, to all of us, especially to those in, in leadership positions. And, and I'm, I'm talking specifically to, to, to my preaching friends because we enter ministry with the determination to, to strengthen the church, to build up the kingdom, but at some point it all becomes about building my kingdom. I like how the message paraphrases Matthew 7, verse 15. There Jesus said, Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practice sincerity. Chances are they're out to rip you off somewhere or the other. Don't be impressed with charisma. Look for character. And who they are is the main thing. And not what they say. Jesus specifically uses a picture here of a dish. 
that, that looks great on the inside, but inside it's filthy. And this is why he says, you pay attention to the inside. Our tendency in our culture is to take the opposite, right? We'll focus on the exterior and we'll just hope that eventually the interior somehow catches up. And respectable frauds within the body think you need maybe a little bit of Jesus to get over my slight imperfections. But all in all, they would think that they're not so bad. And this especially, I think, addresses where we are as a culture. Think for a moment how much emphasis there is in the culture about the outside, about how we look, how many commercials you're going to see uh, on network television about makeup and wardrobe and, and uh, you know, uh, hair growth and, and uh, all, you know, the list is just endless. And, and I have to think that there, there needs to be a balance here because, yeah, you know, the outward appearance is okay. But once again, we're talking about things that have eternal significance. If you're, if you're paying all that attention to the outward and neglecting the inward, then this puts you, I think, in that dubious category. So again, I go back to my inquiry. What if? What if you spend as much time reading the word as you do working out? What if you spent as much time praying for that wayward family member or that rebellious child or that stubborn spouse? If you spent as much time praying for them, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll spend as much time in meditative prayer as you do standing in front of the mirror before you leave the house, how about that? Bound to be more. I think you get the idea. There's nothing wrong with the outward appearance. We we all we all uh, have a you know have have a a point with that. But but I think as Jesus says, first pay attention to the inside. All right, very quickly. Number six. It's kind of connected. Verse verse 27. Jesus says, "Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean." What's the principle? Well, you, you have a you have a tendency to only address. You know, you look better than you really are. Now, sometimes we do that anyway, right? People always ask, "How you doing?" Fine, even though you're sick as a dog. Well, that's okay. Sometimes you do fake it till you make it. You go to work and you don't really want to be at work, but once you get into 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 the work, you know the day uh, the day you know blows on through. That's okay. We're not talking about that. Jesus says you look great on the inside, but you're dying on the inside. Whitewashed tombs. That's an interesting picture because in in Jerusalem, particularly around Jerusalem, every March they began the process of whitewashing the tombs. Can you imagine? We, we, you know, we have a similar, uh, I guess, practice in, in American culture with Decoration Day. Not the same, right? But Decoration Day, you go out before Easter and, and uh, do some, some spring uh, work and weed eating and mowing and cleaning up in the family cemeteries. That's not, not a thing in the world wrong with that. But Jesus said they would do this They would whitewash the tombs in anticipation of of the sheer numbers of people that were going to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. They wanted things to look good. They wanted things to look attractive. and, and, And that's okay. But Jesus uses that as a picture. You look great on the outside, but what's on the inside is completely different. You know, talk to the children of a respectable fraud. Interview their co-workers, talk to his neighbors, and they'll tell you a different story. Uh, One that that would fall into a number of categories of whitewashing uh, so that we look better than we really are. You'll hear statements like, well, he's fine as long as he's not been drinking. She acts nice at church, but she does nothing but complain and tear everybody down at home. Publicly, you know, they, 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 have, they put on a good face, uh, but, but you should hear the arguments they have. Verse 28, Jesus says, In the same way on the outside you appear 
as people of righteousness, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus, and we can't seem to get away from that hypocrisy deal, right? Jesus said you're two-faced, you're, you're double-minded, as if what's on the inside of you has actually died. Well, let, let's just cut to the chase here. Uh, on the outside, the Pharisees looked pretty good. But on the inside, they were filled with dead men's bones. You realize that tombs then were not just for one person. Tombs were, were caves initially that were, that were hewn out to accommodate multiple corpses. John 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, this is why he summoned Lazarus by name. Because there, there were multiple bodies in that tomb all at a different stage of decomposition. I don't think I have to go any further than that. All right? And, and yet Jesus is saying to the, these religious leaders, I, I've noticed that something stinks around here, and it's coming from you. You see, the respectable fraud uh, has, has become this professional pretender the whole series. And he, he begins to, to think that really his sin, his problem, it, you know, is not as bad as, as other people's sin. We hear a lot today and, and, and address uh, as much as well as we can the issues with addiction. And this is what I appreciate about people who struggle with addiction. At some point, they are going to own up to it, right? They are going to acknowledge this is the problem that I have. This is the, what I need to break. This is how I need to try to overcome that. And it's not easy. But at least they own up to it. And we say, well, sin is a sin in God's eyes. And that's true. But for some reason, it's harder for those who wear a mask than it is for those who've acknowledged their struggle. And I'm not saying that, that addiction or chemical dependency is okay. It's just the opposite. What I am saying is, though, it is as horrible and as damaging as that sin is, mine is worse. And what some want to say is, oh, well, we all have sins and that's okay. No, we all have sins and that's, that's not good. And, and at times we'll reach for that mask and we'll put that on instead of acknowledging what that sin is. Now, before you get too... Uh, judgmental and you think well you, you know, you, you, you know you're, you're a little melodramatic here no look at what Jesus says I mean jump all the way to verse 33 and see if he's melodramatic Jesus says you snakes you brood of vipers how will you escape being condemned to hell you see being this respectable fraud is difficult because a fraud always has a hard time admitting he's wrong because one of his biggest fears is simply, well, what if somebody finds out? We look at James chapter 5 and verse 16, and Galen, I don't think I put that on there, but, but there James says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And a respectable fraud thinks he has... Uh, to do a bunch of stuff, they need to do enough things. As we said last week, remember the, the, the uh, illustration of the plates spinning? A respectable fraud thinks he's got to keep that image up, keep up that facade, when really we know just the opposite. I wonder, I wonder if there are times when, when, when people outside the church you know, are initially attracted to, to what we are and what we're about, but, but then they'll, they'll run across one of these frauds and then they become disappointed and disillusioned. Why? Because, yes, we're totally different from the world, but then on closer examination, when, when something really bad happens to one of us and we react and we respond exactly the way the world is, then this seeker, this, this one that, that's watching says, well, boy, there's really not a whole lot of difference. What if? What if we were to, to really take stock? What if we were to really concentrate on how much the condition of our interior has on how we look? 
How would your life be different? Uh, or your schedule, or, or your finances, or your relationships, or your family. Uh, if, if we took the time to inwardly look at who we are, really, and how that has, because you see, that, that relationship with God, that walk with Jesus Christ determines everything about who you are on the outside. That relationship with Jesus Christ determines what you wear. It determines what you say. It determines what you do and how you live. Every aspect of the outward is directly connected to what's inside. Verse 28 of Matthew 23, Jesus says, In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Why do we even move in this area? And and maybe I should have addressed this in the first week of this series. Why do we move in the direction of phoniness? Well, for one reason, uh, we want to hide our flaws. So, so the, the exterior looks a lot better than who we truly are. We won't impress other people so they'll say nice things about us. We don't want people to think that we're weak. And, and so, you know, they come to their own conclusions. Here's one of my greatest fears. I worry that someday I'll stand before the Lord hoping expecting to be handed a crown of righteousness, but instead, the Lord will give me a plaque that simply says, best actor. Instead of hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, the Lord might say, well, you succeeded in fooling everybody else on the earth, but you didn't fool me. I've said on several occasions, and, and we've talked about this in, in, in here in classes, and, and you've come to this conclusion as well, that, that when we come together corporately as a body, we always say, you know, check your egos, check your own agendas, keep those out in the parking lot. That's true, but let me go a, a step further and say that when we walk in here, we need to leave our masks at the door. There, there is, uh, if you'll notice, there was an insert in your bulletin and a lot of good information here on uh, an event to support Christian Women's Job Corp. And I want you to see that. But I want you to turn that over. And h- here is a poem that Ken Medina wrote years ago, many, many years ago. In fact, I, I've referenced it in other settings. But, but the more I poured over this text, this poem continually, and thankfully, this is one of those rare occasions where I'll save something on the computer. And I saved this one. And, and for good reason. And, and I had Lisa duplicate that. And, and it's something that you might want to keep uh, and, and, and keep it close because I think this is, this is the objective. It's entitled, If This Is Not a Place. If this is not a place where tears are understood, then where do I go to cry? If this is not a place where my spirit can take wing, then where do I go to fly? If this is not a place where my question can be asked, Where do I go to seek? If this is not a place where my feelings can be heard, then where do I go to speak? If this is not a place where you accept me just as I am, then where do I go to be free? And if this is not a place where I can try and learn and grow, then where can I go to just be me? And my point with that is, yeah, okay, check your egos, check your agendas before you come in here. How about this one? How about checking your masks? And instead of leaving them at the door, how about just throwing them away? There's a seventh woe very quickly in verse 29. We've already alluded to it. Verses 29 and 30. Jesus said, you're really just respectable frogs. What I find compelling about this last one is he, he, has, he has leveled these accusations against them and now his tone changes dramatically. And, and he moves from, from his anger, from that passion, now it turns to sorrow. 
Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who, sent, who were sent to you, how often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, Jesus already knew what was going to happen. Jesus already knew that as much as they prided themselves on saying, hey, if, if we had been around, uh, we would have not persecuted the, the prophets the way our forefathers did. We wouldn't have done that. And Jesus says, you're, 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 so, you know, you're, you're such a fraud. If we could somehow take all of Matthew chapter 23 and we could summarize this entire series and put it into one phrase, I would think that, that, that Jesus would want to convey to, to some to, you know, people then and to us this morning, and that is to live spiritual authenticity. Now, I know it's completely impossible to, to, to eradicate all the hypocrisy that I have. By the way, it is for you too. But I think we're, we're moving into a good direction. There, there, there's no one perfect, and the world wants us to, to, to remind us of that. And, and the world counters, well, if you're a good person and you're better than most people, then, then you're, you're, you know, you're, you're probably ahead of the game. And that's, that's not... Jesus talking, that's Satan. You know, you don't have to be the best person, just be better than everybody else. And you get into this comparison game, but, but hear me out. If, if heaven is a place of perfection, then if you have one sin in your life, there's no way you can get there. The Bible says, the, the prophet Isaiah said, that, that your righteousness is like filthy rags compared to a holy God. I can remember growing up, my father joined one of those book clubs. You know, every month they'd send you a book, and then you spent more money sending it back than probably what the book would cost because of shipping and handling, and he got locked into that. And, of course, I did the same thing with uh, Record Club. Uh, everybody gets drawn into that. They'd send you four or five albums every month. Most of it you never heard of, and, but then, you know, you had to send it back or, or pay for them. Uh, but that book, generation ago, was entitled, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Remember that one? I'm okay, you're okay. And the writer basically says, look, uh, and he, he walked us through what was then called transactional analysis. I'm not sure what it's called now. But he talks about four different ways to look at your life. I'm okay, you're okay. I'm okay, but you're not okay. Number three, I'm not okay, you're not okay. And then fourthly, I'm not okay, but you're okay. Yeah, confusing as the day is long. And I know it sounds, you know, kind of strange, but the premise of the book led people to think that everything was okay. The title was the premise, I'm okay and you're okay. In other words, everybody is fine. But there's a problem with that. The premise is false. You see, the Bible teaches what? I'm not okay. But you're not okay either. But because of Jesus... That's okay. You don't have to be perfect. There's only one who is. And so what's the purpose in trying to fool people into thinking that we are okay? Why exhaust yourself pretending to be, to, pretending to be something that you're not? And, and we don't have to try to earn our way to heaven. That, that's draining and not to mention impossible, by the way. But for those of us who put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and commit to living for him, he promises to make up the difference. And that's okay too, by the way. And, and, and when you begin to grasp this, this, this consuming truth, you're not as concerned about how you look on the outside. You still try to do the right things and, and, and live a good life, but, but from the outset, you need to understand... Christian authenticity, hear me before we leave, Christian authenticity is not about being yourself. It's about dying to self. And I weary, and I've dealt with it in, 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 in counseling situations and in trying to help people. I, I weary this, well, that's just the way I am. That's just me. That's who I am. People either you know, accept me or, or, or reject me for who I am. I've got to be me. I think there's a song. 
Well, okay, that sounds good. That sounds trendy. But read Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The goal isn't just authenticity. You see, Hitler was authentic. Osama bin Laden was authentic. I mean, he lived out his convictions, but he was evil. So the goal is not authenticity. The goal is spiritual authenticity. And it's a life that's different today than it was yesterday. It's not it's not that you're sinless. It just means that the closer you draw to Jesus, you sin less and less and less. Well, we're closing things out this morning. It's time for anyone here to make a decision. And, and, and we're not concerned about uh, previous uh, issues with hypocrisy. Uh, it doesn't matter how many people you fooled yesterday or, or last week or last month. The question is, are you willing to put that behind you and to confess Jesus Christ that, that, that you've struggled and, and you're tired? You're tired of being a respectable fraud. And are you willing to allow Jesus Christ to change you from the inside out? He'll do that. But you have to initiate that. You have to step out and say, I cannot live like this. I want him to take that control. And if we can help you in any way to facilitate that, we'll stand and sing and encourage you to come.